Welcome everyone to this very first free copyright webinar on um, copyright and school libraries. Um, it's a big important area that we've been working on for several years and that's accumulated in writing this book, which I hope will be really helpful. Um, I'm Carrie Russell. I work in the Washington office of the American Library Association and one of my gigs is um, copyright. And, you know, we do copyright education for members. And I think over the last few years, we could, you know, easily say that we've done a lot of work getting librarians, academic school public to be a lot more aggressive in their understanding of what the copyright law means and how librarians can more fully exercise copyright exceptions to benefit their communities. And so um, this um, presentation will have that perspective. And I just want to check one more time that everybody can hear me. And now we will begin. So you know we're selling a book um, and we have a little promotion going on right now. So we wanted to alert people to that. I think Jazzy sent out some other information in regards to that. So um, that was our first thing to say that we are selling a book and it's on a discount. First thing we want to talk about is the purpose of the copyright law, which I believe people um, tend to get wrong. And uh, we did some surveys about seven or eight years ago asking school librarians what they thought the purpose of the copyright law was. And we found that, again, most people didn't understand what it was, only 30%. So let's see, I, I did this little poll. We're going to do a little game here. Do you all see um, my poll? I hope I, that you could see it right now. I'm going to ask you guys to vote. Look at this. That changed. All right, people, you're, lo you're doing pretty good. We've made some progress, definitely, because the correct answer is number two. The purpose of the copyright law is to promote learning and the dissemination of knowledge. Now, it's really important to understand that this is like really key because um, when um, the Founding Fathers created the copyright law. Their goal was to make sure that the new democracy could be very well functioning by ensuring that people had access to information. They're writing a whole new constitution. They have separate states that they're trying to um, get together as the United States. They want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. So for the Founding Fathers, the copyright law was important, just as important to them as the post office. The post office was a really big deal for the Founding Fathers because, again, they wanted to make sure that people had access to information. So often we hear that the copyright law's purpose is to make sure that people are paid. That is not correct. That's a means to the end. Um, what we're trying to do is to encourage authors and other creators to disseminate their work, you know, free or for a fee, um, so that knowledge is out there and shared. But the reason we have the copyright law to begin with is to promote learning and the dissemination of knowledge. Okay, this is, um, we had a lot of illustrations in, in our book, um, um, 
uh, and I pulled out a couple of them. These are these are illustrations by Jessica Abel. And um, one of the things I'd hear from school librarians is people used to say stuff like, it used to be so easy, I just said no. I'm telling you, do not be this person. Do not be the person in your library that says, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do this. Because actually there's a lot of things that people can do and it's your job to help them be able to do those things in lawful ways. So this is a real, um, actually really person actually sent me this email. It used to be easy. I just said, no, do not be this person. Okay, here's a brief review of the copyright law. Exclusive rights make up the monopoly created by Congress. So the copyright law is created by Congress in statute, and it is actually saying that creators of works can have this limited monopoly, meaning that they're the only ones that can um, profit or sell from their works for a particular period of time under certain conditions. And the monopoly is created, um, it, it, it is like five exclusive rights of copyright, and these are the ones that I think you all know, the right to reproduce a work, distribute a work to the public, the right to create a derivative work based on the original, and the rights of public performance and public display. Some of these were added later on as you know different modes of communication developed and different works became popular, like motion pictures. Before motion pictures, we really didn't have this need for a public performance right, but that was added over time as the copyright law evolved. Now, these exclusive rights are divisible and they can be inherited, they can be given, or they can be contracted away. This is important because sometimes you're going to ask a rights holder to use an exclusive right. You're going to say, oh, I want to show this motion picture in an exhibition on Friday. We're going to charge $2. We've rented the film. It's going to be 16 millimeter. we got to ask permission of the rights holders to be able to show that film. And you engage in a license agreement with the rights holder, and you're asking specifically, may we use the public performance right? You're not asking if you can have any of these other rights. So you, you're just asking for that particular right. So you can see how these can be divided up. Sometimes rights are divided up amongst many different rights holders, which makes things you know, really compl complicated. Um, they are inherited by heirs. Um, you can write your uh, exclusive rights away. We have always used the example of the scholarly journal article written by the professor who signs the licensed agreement with Elsevier Publishing and basically says, Elsevier, you own all of my exclusive rights. And um, that's something very easily that people fall trapped to. And um, for trade publications, we see that the authors almost always have all of their exclusive rights. But it's good to uh, understand these as a bundle and that they can be separated out. Um, materials that are protected by copyright are original and creative works fixed in a tangible medium, and they get automatic copyright protection under the law as it exists right now. This means that your work, if it could be protected by copyright, it must be not a copy of somebody else's work. It must be original. It must have a little bit of creativity. It must be perceptible to other people. Words on a page or, you know, sounds on a DVD. And under our current law, as soon as that material is fixed in the tangible medium, you get automatic copyright protection. This is where I usually say, like, if you're getting bored and you're starting to take notes about things that you're going to buy, a list of to-do items, if that's creative enough um, and it's original, you have automatic copyright protection on your to-do list. Another very important distinction um, is the difference between a copyright and a copy. Um, lots of times we'll get questions about, oh, like I have a copy of a work, I bought it lawfully. Now what I want to do with that work is I want to cut it up and make it into like an artwork. Is that a copyright infringement? No, because you're just dealing with that own copy that you you have. The copyright is the exclusive rights. So if you have a copy, you can read it, you can destroy it. There's a lot of things you can do with it. 
but you can't exercise the exclusive rights that make up the monopoly created by Congress unless there is an exception or a good reason why that you should be able to be able to do that. Clear as mud. Now there are holes in the copyright monopoly and um, by this I mean you have these exceptions that are legal rules that allow you to use a copyright without prior authorization and without paying a fee. Libraries have a, have a, a number of exceptions that are addressed just to them. Um, you often hear about limitations and these are other ways that the copyright monopoly is restricted. But in general, exceptions and limitations are holes in the monopoly what lets a user exercise the right of copyright under certain conditions. Um, we want the monopoly to be a little bit restricted because if it was not, we wouldn't be able to actually advance the progress of the science of useful arts. We need to be able to use information that's been produced to create new information. And if we didn't have these little loopholes in there, um, essentially you would be paying for access to information. You'd have to ask the rights holder how you could use it, when you could use it. The free flow of information, not free information, but the free flow of information would be uh, disrupted. And that was not what the Congress wanted to see in our copyright law. So our statutory monopoly, monopoly is limited by privileges that I know that you guys know about, like fair use for sale interlibrary loan. It's limited by uh, the public domain, which is extremely long. The current term is life of the author plus 70 years. There is no public policy justification in having a long term of copyright. Um, it just so happened that the rights holders and their heirs have been successfully fighting for extensions of the copyright term over the years and that's how it's gotten to the point that it has gotten to. So really there's no public benefit at all in a long term. But the heirs are benefiting from this long term because they can continue to collect royalties from their grandfather's you know, famous plays and music, stuff like that. There are checks on what can be protected in the law. Facts cannot be protected and of course there's a good public policy rationale for this because if, if facts were protected again you'd have to ask to get a fact. You'd have to find the person that held the fact and ask them can, can I look at that fact. You'd have to rediscover facts. Facts are in the public domain. So you know how many people can be in our, my office without breaking a fire code is a fact and no one can own that fact. Lists are not protected either. And so if your grocery list, if you are just going right down there, milks, egg, blah, 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 just a list of things, not protected. Processes are also not protected, but they may be protected by patent law. So, you know, the way to swing a hammer might be a process and it could be protected by some kind of patent law that involves the swinging of a hammer and some kind of mechanical device. Federal government documents, they are not protected, but not always. Sometimes uh, they're contracted out to private groups who claim protection. It's really bad when public documents are protected by copyright. These really should be in the public domain because they're the facts and the laws of our country and everyone should have access to those for free. Um, one of my favorite um, limitations is the idea versus expression dichotomy. Very important. Um, I was on the reference desk um, when I was working at the University of Arizona. I had someone come to the reference desk and they said, I have an idea for a book, but I don't want anybody to steal it, so what should I do? And I said, well, you can't really get any kind of protection unless you express that idea in an original way. And then you can claim copyright ownership over it. And then you can get some semblance of protection. So the idea itself, ideas flow around all over the place. They're not protected. But the creative expression is protected under copyright. The perfect example, I think, is um, the soap opera genre. In the soap opera, and 
I know even if you don't watch soap operas, you know that this is true. There is often the same kinds of ideas that occur. Issues around paternity. Who is the father of this baby? Issues around, you know, someone having an identical twin. How did that happen? Um, oftentimes, pregnant women giving birth to babies in unlikely scenarios, in an elevator, during a snowstorm, where the person that helps in the delivery of the baby is generally the real father. Now, you know these kinds of ideas occur all the time in the soap opera genre. But each time they do occur, they're expressed differently. And it's the expression that's protected rather than the idea. Very important. Does that make sense? I hope so. Socially beneficial uses of copyright materials are central to the purpose of the copyright law. So Congress is saying that, you know, there are, we want uh, authors to, to um, be able to be rewarded for their creativity because we want all this information to be available to people. But when you're using information in a socially beneficial way, there's more latitude in your ability to use that information in ways that are not infringing. So these are often expressed in copyright exceptions. For example, we know that in the classroom you need to do a public performance if you're showing a video in the classroom. The law allows that without you having to ask the rights holder for prior permission under Section 110. Because the public performance in the classroom is advancing some kind of knowledge, it's being key to learning or teaching, which is a socially beneficial use. So places of learning, enrichment, and scholarship have a special status in the copyright law. Um, they have more leniency because they are sites of learning. And nonprofit educational institutions and their libraries are um, the institutions that have been specifically singled out as needing exceptions. So Congress already says libraries and nonprofit educational institutions are special under the copyright law. Now we know copyright is often confused with some other intellectual property right law, um, patents, trademark, trade secret, which I know very little about and we're not going to talk about them. Um, in the digital environment, particularly, we're dealing with licensing. License terms will not necessarily get you what you can get under the copyright law. And as we talked earlier, when you ask permission to use a copyright work, when you do need a license, that's when you engage in a contract. Contract law is state law. Um, and it assumes that there is an agreement between two parties about what is allowed and what is not allowed when you're using a particular work, in particular uh, digital work in our environment. Fair use guidelines, often confused with copyright. Um, but they do not have the force and effect of law. Now let me see if I can pull up this thing. Are you familiar with fair use guidelines is my question. And what I mean by that is, oops, let's see. These kinds of guidelines that say stuff like you can use 10% of a work, you can use 10% of a chapter of a work and not have to ask permission. Would you please vote and ask me if you are familiar with these fair use guidelines? Hopefully I'm doing this right. What we've learned is that, in fact, over the, the years, especially I like to think we've all taken, um, taken some credit for this, is that, let's see, you can't see it. Do you see it?
And if we don't, if you don't see it, oh, okay. Well, then I'm not going to even bother because I, it says hosts are not yet set up. Okay, that's cool. Um, what we've seen, I'm just going to close this thing that I'm trying to do. Um, what we've seen is that people are beginning to understand that these arbitrary rules about 10% of a book or five minutes from a film to use these without authorization, they've, they've begun to see that these are just arbitrary rules that really, um, you know, uh, don't have any rationale under the law. People use them as their institutional policy, and I know this is often true in a big library where you might have a photocopy center or something like that, and you have a lot of student workers that are working there, and you, you know, can't expect a student worker to do a fair use assessment every time somebody wants to copy something from a book, so you tell them, oh, only let people copy like one chapter, um, just so people don't go hog wild with copying. But these fair use guidelines are not in the law at all, and um, I was just checking online, and I'm seeing that more and more people recognize that these um, things really are arbitrary and meaningless, and people are now talking a lot more about uh, fair use instead, which is great. Now, plagiarism is another thing that people get confused with copyright. Um, and you can infringe and plagiarize at the same time, or you can do one or the other separately, but they're not the same thing. Um, which, see, first, I got a question. Doesn't it depend on the transformative nature of the work? Yes, fair use often does depend on the transformative nature of the work. When you're thinking about a fair use determination and you're saying, well, you know, uh, for example, Google. I'm going to copy every website that's on the internet and I'm going to do that copying without asking anybody's permission because what I'm doing is creating an index which is a socially beneficial thing and is transformative and the law says yeah that's fair that's a cool thing that you're doing um, so fair use okay fair use guidelines are not in law is it worth our brochure to include them I would not, well, you know, I think that if you're handing out a brochure to people, um, I would not include them. I would, um, I would prefer that you talk about the copyright law under the fair use determination um, and that the librarian is there to help the user, the teacher, the student. Um, make a fair use determination. I think if you have a sec, you know, a part of your library where you just have a lot of work going through, like a photocopy center, there may be reasons to use these guidelines for workflow purposes. But I would not promote them because they're, you know, they're just not the truth. It's misleading to say that the, this is the law when it's not. Yeah, Susan is right. It's misleading. Sometimes you can use the entire work, and as my example, my lame example of Google and websites was exactly that. Now let me go on a little bit here about plagiarism versus copyright infringement. Plagiarism is a harder uh, word to spell than copyright infringement. I think that's probably the really the really big big difference. It's not a law, whereas the copyright is a federal law. So there's not something in the law that says you know, Title 42, you can't plagiarize. It's wrong because it's saying that something uh, that somebody else wrote, you're claiming that you're the author of that work, and it certainly should be something that should be taught to kids that they should not, should not do. Um, but breaking the copyright law is different than plagiarism. If you use a work beyond, let's say you take a work and you copy it and you sell it on eBay, you are infringing copyright. If you also say that that work was written by you, you are a plagiarist as well. So there is a distinction between um, the two, but they often can happen at the same time. Um, so that's why it can be confusing. What we need to do when we talk about plagiarism and copyright infringement in terms of both of these things is we need to teach students about citing references. I have found that many people have questions about citations, 
or these are not really like, um, you know, some questions you should be asking a copyright spe a specialist. Your institution should decide on what your style format is, is going to be and encourage people to use citation formats. Under copy, with copyright, even if your use of many different works, let's say in a collage or whatever, is fair, you want to provide attribution, so you want to cite references. When you're writing a paper and you're using documentation to prove a point, you want to be able to cite those people, um, all that stuff. I think somehow we forgot how to teach citation, and it's probably because it's just so easy in the digital environment to just copy and paste things all over the place that people are kind of forgetting to do it. Um, but there is a difference and you probably will be asked that question quite a bit as you're working in the school. Okay, here's another picture from the book, um, Drama Queen. Is your job worth that 60 second clip you're showing? There's a lot of copyright books that have been written um, in the past, especially those directed to the school environment that are just ridiculous books that are you have been written to really frighten people into thinking that everything that they do is a potential infringement. This is just not true. A lot of what we can do in the school environment is fair because as we already know, we're privileged under the copyright law and according to Congress. We'll talk more about that as we move forward. People often worry about liability um, they feel like, okay, I hear what you're saying, but you're not in the classroom with me, and I don't want to be a test case. You know, I, I don't want to be the one that the rights holders go after, and I screw over the whole school by making a stupid mistake, losing my job, getting fired, whatever. Um, your liability is just, I have to tell you, extremely, extremely, extremely low. It's very unlikely that a teacher or librarian would ever be taken to court. Now, you might get a cease and desist letter, you might get a threatening letter from a rights holder, but that's not the same thing as being taken to court. This does not happen. And there are reasons why it doesn't happen. One, Section 504C2 limits statutory damages for alleged inf infringers who work at nonprofit educational institutions. So if you're a librarian working in a school and you have reason to believe that what you did was a fair use, even if you're taken to court, the rights holder cannot get statutory damages out of you. And this is where the money cranks up. This is when we're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in damages. They don't want to take you to court because they can't get any money out of you, even if you were found to be an infringer, which is highly unlikely. Another reason is that we have this thing, the 11th Amendment, which says that a state or state agency, so your school or library is funded in part by the state, you cannot be sued for dollar damages by the federal government. So again, the rights holder has little reason to take you to court because there's no money there. Also, it's a very risky proposition for a rights holder to take some shining um, pro um, positive example librarian school teacher to court um, and they don't want to do it because it makes them look bad it could set a precedent and the fact of the matter is they actually do quite well um, settling outside of court what we often see is that uh, a library might get a cease and desist letter and the rights holder will threaten court action and then say, hey, you have to pay up this fee or we're going to take you to court. That's a lot easier and more lucrative for a rights holder to do than to take the time to file papers and take you to court. I would hope that you wouldn't cave, you know, when you get a cease and desist letter, but I understand there are reasons why that schools are afraid that they might be taken to court. But I want you to remember that your liability is very, very, very low. And if you've heard otherwise, it's just not true. Um, we do know that people have been, uh, again, received cease and desist letters, or there have, has been a couple of little litigations in regards to software back in the 80s, but you know, the thought that everybody's been taken to the pokey is just not true. 
So you don't want to be the copyright police. I know a lot of you say you don't want to be the copyright police, but then sometimes you end up being the copyright police because of fear of something going wrong or things, um, a lack of clarity, but don't do it. Just, just prevent yourself from doing it. Now here is the key thing, the fair use. Um, Section 107 in the copyright law. This is the most important thing for all librarians to know is the fair use doctrine. Um, it is, uh, as I said, codified in the Copyright Act of 1976. It's right there in the copyright law. And it's determined on a case-by-case -case basis. It requires that you think and make a judgment call. And you may never know for sure if your judgment call is correct or not. And you have to live with that ambiguity. So, for example, you may have a teacher asking you if they can use something in the classroom and you go through a fair use analysis with them and you determine with the teacher that yeah it's it, I think it's fair go ahead and do it you might never know if that's true or not because ultimately that decision can only be decided by a court and you're never going to go to court so you have to just trust your judgment and the more you use fair use the more you will find that you understand it and you feel comfortable doing it. I see we have a question from Susan. Do I think there's a need to subscribe to the Copyright Clearance Center? I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about a blanket license with the Copyright Clearance Center. We have seen some libraries do that. The, the bad thing about doing that is you will be paying a fee for uses that are fair. You will also be paying a fee for uses for which the Copyright Clearance Center has no rights to. Um, I think that the Copyright Clearance Center, of course, would like for us all to sign a license, but I want you to remember that this is a for-profit company um, they're not nonprofit anymore. They are for-profit company working on behalf of rights holders. Um, they're um, naturally they're um, they want to collect as much money as they can for the rights holders. I mean, that's all fine and well, but their interests are not your interests in general. I would think long and hard before I would get um, a copyright clearance center blanket license. Although I know some people have made that decision, and again, it's going to be an individual decision. Um, that you, you know, will have to make based on how you feel about risk. I'm telling you that your risk is very low. You may not feel comfortable with that, so you might want to get some kind of license. Chris says, yeah, they don't want to work with K through 12. That's true. I mean, I know the only licenses I know of that they're selling are to academic institutions. But K through 12, that's right, they're not going to sell. They don't want to. And I, I guess they just don't feel that there's really um, a market there. Um, I, and I think that in the school environment, things are a lot more contained in many ways so that the threat is not there. There's a lot of things people are doing that are tolerated. They want to expose people to copyrighted works a little bit more, so they might be more lenient. Um, but use music over the PA at a football game, for example. It isn't covered under fair use in K through 12. But there's no way to purchase licensing. That is true. Um, again, it seems to be that this kind of use, unlike in the higher education environment, is tolerated by rights holders. They're just saying, OK, yeah, they're going to play music at the football game. We don't care. Um, I hope it stays that way. But um, you know, right now, um, K through 12, they're not really coming after you with all these licenses. OK. Let's look at the four factors of fair use in great detail. Um, first of all, the first factor, and we talked a little bit about transformative uses earlier on, um, this plays into this one, is the purpose of the use. Why do you want to use an exclusive right of copyright? So this is like saying to you, OK, you're going to do a talent show at the school. You want to play background. Um, music um, during intermission. Um, you want to you use that just to 
you know, kind of give the audience a break to make it still more entertaining. It's a nonprofit use. It's not an educational use per se, but it's a nonprofit use that you that you want to use. Let's say that that is what you're trying to do. Now, the purpose of the use. On one hand, think of it: is this use nonprofit and educational? On way one side of the continuum. On the other side of the continuum, is this a for-profit commercial use? In our example. Um, playing music during intermission is a nonprofit use, but it's not really educational. So it's not really on the far end of that spectrum of the purpose of the use, but it's somewhere toward there. When you're looking at these four factors, you're going to have to make these kind of judgments. Oh, it's leaning towards fair. It's not as fair as if it was an educational use. So that would be the first um, factor. Uh, uh, as of late, the courts have been paying a lot more attention to the purpose of the use factor. And even in situations where the use is commercial and for-profit, if the use has been transformative, um, courts have ruled that those uses are fair. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The second factor is the nature of the publication. And this is what is the material that you're using. It has two aspects. On the one hand, is the material that you're using published, already available in the marketplace, or is this material something that's never had a chance in the marketplace? Unpublished diaries that the rights holder may in fact never want to make publish. Um, under the law, unpublished materials, it's less likely that your use of those is going to be fair than if the material is already published. That doesn't mean every published work that you use can be fair. It just means that the unpublished works tend to be more protected. And of course, the very famous court case in this regard um, was the Nation uh, versus Harper and Rowe publications regarding um, President Ford's book in which he reveals why he pardoned President Nixon. An unpublished manuscript was obtained by the Nation publication they revealed the key kernel of the book of why the four did pardon Nixon. And even though it was just a little teeny piece of the book, it was an unpublished book part and it was key. And the court ruled that that was not a fair use. So something unpublished, usually people want to keep it hidden until they decide when they want to publish it. Very important. The other aspect of the nature of the publication is whether or not a work is you know, considered really, really creative or more factual in nature. And this is kind of a, you know, kind of an arbitrary kind of distinction, but the courts have ruled that things like motion pictures, music, poetry, drama um, are more creative. They're made up stories, so there was a lot of creativity that went involved in it. And so therefore, they deserve more copyright protection versus a newspaper article that is factual in nature. The journalist wrote a creative article, but the stuff that's in there is, is facts. And, and in general, that type of work has less copyright protection. So again, there's that spectrum there of the kind of work that you're using. In our example, we're using music that's going to be played during the intermission. And that is uh, a more creative work um, that is worthy of more copyright protection. So see, you're starting to have to weigh these things right now, even between the two uh, factors that we've discussed so far. The third factor is the amount of the work that you're using. And this is pretty clear. If you use a lot of the work, it's going to be less fair than if you use a portion of the work. But again, in some instances, using the entire work has been considered fair. Um, let me give you an example. This um, was a court case that had to do with the Grateful Dead. A woman uh, wrote a coffee table book about the history of the Grateful Dead. In it, she um, copied the full images of Grateful Dead music tour posters without authorization. It was a book that she sold and made money on. She didn't ask anybody permission to use these posters that were created by other people. Um, and the court ruled that this use was fair. Why? Because the court said that 
the way that these works were used, these posters, promotional tour posters were used, were used in a different way than they were initially intended. And in fact, their use was transformative, a way to trace the history of the Grateful Dead. So the court thought this is fine and this is a fair use, even though the entire posters were used. So this can often, um, you know, you can use a whole work sometimes. Not all the time, not likely, but sometimes. And of course, the last factor is the effect on the, the market. And um, people uh, sometimes say that this is the most important factor. What kind of an economic harm are you causing to the rights holder? Right now, we can clearly say that the first factor has been more important to the courts as of late. The effect on the market is something you should consider, and it should be something that you can see very obviously that it is an effect on the market. For example, um, you buy um, a workbook. Um, your library budget is you know, very low. A workbook for every student is required, but you don't want to buy all the workbooks, so you produce you know, 50 copies. Obviously, this has a direct effect on the market for the work, because for these workbook publishers, they're depending on a market where many, many copies are sold. So that is clearly something that you would go, whoa, that's wrong. Um, that is not a fair use. Now I'm going to go over and look at some questions. Um, Kristen, in our libraries, we have proposed professional materials that include lesson plans or some reproducibles. Isn't that up to the teacher who borrows to not copy? Or should we even not include that in the library for checkout? Um, I think that um, this is for sure, in my opinion, a discussion that you should have um, with the teachers to make a determination. Um, I think that um, you, you'd need to look at each instance. How are these lesson plans, how are they needed? Is, there, is the reproduction of these lesson plans part of a license agreement with the publication? Can the teacher make reproducibles? Um, does the teacher want to make copies every semester? Um, do you want to put them instead on library reserve and let students come and copy them? All those are just kinds of questions that you're going to have to work out depending on the situation of the use. I, I can't be as clear, any more clear on that um, unless you can be really specific in this chat thing. Okay, what about a school creating an anthology of readings for a course? Don't you need to get copyright clearance for writings that would be used? In general, yes. When you are creating an anthology uh, and kind of like a course pack, and you are using that those sets of work to replace what would be ordinarily a textbook or some other required work, in general, you should get permission for the uses of those readings. However, consider each reading. Is the reading in the public domain? You don't need to get permission for that one. Is the reading such a small portion and factual in nature that you can argue that the use is fair? Then don't get permission. So again, um, you'd, you'd need to think through each of the material uh, materials that you have. Now, now we see these anthologies are sold to students for the price of printing, and no money is made from the sale. Again, this is something where permission is probably required, even though no profit is being made, because um, you're taking out these distinct pieces for which ordinarily a student would have to pay for each piece. Um, anthologies also, when you're looking at like short stories in a book, and that kind of thing, these kinds of uses are really, um, really, really matter to the rights holders. Um, it's the only way that they continue to make royalties at all. So I think when you're looking at that kind of thing, I would examine each piece and, in general, get permission, um, especially if it's something that is required for every student and if it's something that you plan on using again in the future. What about students downloading from pirate sites on school providing computers? What is the district's liability? Okay. There is um, a part of the copyright law that was passed um, 
in 1998 that has to do with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and third-party liability. It basically says that you, as a, as a party offering an internet service via Verizon or whatever, you have no control over what users are doing on that service because you don't monitor their use. So you should not be held liable for any kind of shenanigans that people are doing on the, the website. Uh, the bargain in that agreement is that if a rights holder approaches you and says, hey, we've discovered that somebody is using some BitTorrent site to pirate a bunch of movies and we want to know who that student is or we want you to take down that material, you are obligated to do that in order to get the third party liability protection so you won't be sued. Um, this has happened a lot in higher ed. Um, it's beginning to happen in public libraries. I'm not sure if it happens a lot in school libraries. But the basic rule is you're not responsible if you had no control over it. You should do some things, though, to encourage lawful use such as putting um, a label or um, a sign up that says, you know, many of the works you're going to find on the, web, on the web are protected by copyright. Further distribution and reproduction of those works may be an infringement of the copyright law. You may want to have a stronger policy where, you know, you say something like, if we have good reason to believe that you've been using these terminals for infringing purposes, you know, we're going to send a letter home to your parents or whatever you might, you know, want to do. But um, you, you, obviously you can't control every single thing that a kid is doing, but um, try to encourage the lawful behavior. Um, will I talk about the use of copyrighted materials and uploading to YouTube? I could. Um, yeah, YouTube um, is an interesting kind of situation because things have changed over time. Um, when you upload uh, an original work on YouTube, you engage in a license agreement with YouTube. It's just, it says that you still own the rights to the work, but they also have the rights to, you know, publicly perform your work. If a rights holder finds that some of the work on your YouTube video is their work, uh, they can decide to contact YouTube and ask that you take it down. or they can decide to just let you continue to use it and get a share of the advertising profits that are available on YouTube. A lot of things have changed over the last few years with YouTube where we see rights holders trying to kind of capitalize on the use of incidental, you know, uses of works in YouTube videos. Um, I think in general when you're talking about when you're in a school situation, uh, someone's making a video for class, Obviously, if you put it on YouTube, there's going to be a greater risk if you have protected works involved. So again, you want to be more thoughtful if you do that. I know a lot of kids will want to do that, but if you keep the, the video con contained within the school setting, you know, in general, these uses are almost always fair. Um, doesn't fair haven fall short in a school that is monitoring usage? Yeah. That's right. If you are already implicated in monitoring usage, it, it's, one could argue that you are aware that infringing is going on and that you are uh, secondarily liable for infringement. So it's care you gotta be you got to be careful not to get too involved in this moder moderating, moderating because um, the rights holder could pinpoint you, seek you out. Although, again, it's unlikely in the in the nonprofit setting. Do terms, don't terms of use from websites supersede fair use? Um, yes, they can. And in fact, um, it's a big issue with the, the digital environment is that we do have these terms of use that are supposedly an agreement uh, between you and the rights holder on how you're going to use a particular work. And it may say stuff that all kinds of things that, you know, ordinarily you would think would be fair uses. This even goes to non-negotiated click on 
uh, licenses that, of course, you see all the time on the web or when you're downloading with iTunes. Courts have ruled that these are legally binding agreements in general. So, yeah, they can completely supersede fair use altogether, which is a, you know, a bad public policy situation. Um, sometimes we'll get questions about this and um, I think there, you know, we, we actually try to reach out to like the iTunes of the world and say, hey, you know, how about a school environment? I mean, can you have like a license in that regard? You know, we're trying to get them to understand that there's not just just individual consumers using their services. Um, but, you know, in general, that's how these companies think and, and are looking at these things that way. And these licenses generally say personal, non-commercial use only, which would mean nothing in the schoolroom setting. Um, okay. Okay, Julia, uh, a student using an iTunes song in a presentation, what about that? stays in the class. I think that in general this is, you know, even though the iTunes um, license, you know, if we read it, it would say this student, even though they lawfully acquired this this iTunes song by paying 99 cents or whatever, uh, the license is going to say this is for personal non-commercial use only. Um, now, do you, the question is, do you decide to violate that contract term. Um, it's a choice. Obviously, people are violating this contract term all the time. So far, iTunes doesn't seem to care. It could be one of those situations where the use is tolerated. I myself would not worry about it that much, especially as we move into an environment where songs are only going to be available in these kind of downloadable forms and people are going to want to use them in the classroom. In a way, I'm saying violate the contract, which sounds terrible, um, but I think we're moving to a situation where common sense says this is happening and in, in, my, in, in my situation, I would allow it as long as it stays in the classroom. I wouldn't start putting it on the web or anything like that. Don't DVD say that as well? Classroom use of a DVD would be a, would be the parallel, correct? Um, they do say that in the beginning. I think maybe you're talking about the FBI warning that says these materials can't be used for anything but um, home use. Um, that is, there's a slightly different thing going on there. That is a notice that the rights holders is trying to encourage you to use a product in a particular way. It's not a license agreement that you assent to by clicking on an agree button. Um, you can ignore that home use notice if you want to use a home use video in the classroom. You can do that under section, section 110. That's fine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, okay. Now, we went through this um, fair use thing. And I know sometimes people think, well, what if I'm wrong? Um, you make a fair use determination. You could be wrong. Well, you're never going to know if you're right or wrong sometimes. But what we're asking you to do is to think very critically, um, consider um, what your mission is as a librarian in the school environment and how you can help um, users make fair uses. Um, I, I've been talking to people about see the gray, like a lot of people go, well, that's a gray area. I don't know what's right, what's wrong. It's gray. We don't know if it's right or wrong. I mean, get over it. But see the gray and see the opportunities in the gray where somebody's use might actually not be fair, but by working with the teacher or the student, you can trim it back and make it a fair use. Um, as a librarian, of, of course, I'm always harping on how you are um, the professional that um, represents the rights of your community. Now, I have to ask Jazzy, how long do I have? Do I have an hour or do I have an hour and a half? I often, you know, I never time these things. Okay, I have until 5.30. Okay, we're good. We might not get to all of the slides, but I think it's important to take the questions as they come up. Um, your statement, defend the library user, it's so much more positive. Yes, I'm trying to be positive. 
And because really, think about it, the copyright law, when you think about it, the reason that it's there to advance knowledge, to benefit the public, it's a positive thing. The copyright law is a friend of ours, and we should be positive, positive about it. Um, I, and the, the fact of the matter is we do have this latitude, as, as we described earlier on. Okay, what about teachers playing full-length movies in the classrooms? Are they violating? No, they are not. Um, and let me see if I can, um, I've got this. Let me get to that. I have a public performance slide. Um, let me get just get through this fair use thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about public performances. Um, what I think is interesting about fair use, that it involves none of these specific quantifications, as we talked about, 10%, blah, blah, blah. That fair use, as we said, you might not know if you're ever right. <laughs> because ultimately, a Supreme Court is the final arbiter, and they obviously don't look at every single fair use case that happens. Fair use things are happening hundreds of times a day in your school. Um, they're, they're just happening. Um, the court rulings, as we discussed, favor these transformative uses. Um, fair use can protect you from bad outcomes in the court of law. Again, when you, as a nonprofit, um, um, employee in a library or an educational institution, if you are trying to understand fair use and you have reason to believe that your uses are fair, again, there's very limited remedy status for the rights holder in, in your regard. So fair use, the more you use it, the better off you are because it gives you this kind of protection. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is you may have seen these practitioners' best practices that have been published lately. Maybe the one that school people may be the most familiar with is Renee Hobbs' best practices in regards to the teaching of media literacy, a fantastic publication where the user community is kind of deciding, hey, this is what we need to do in order to meet our mission, to accomplish our role in the educational institution. So these are the kinds of things that we think are fair uses. So keep, uh, keep an eye on that. Um, and then, of course, the question that came up earlier is if fair use exists in the license, licensing environment. And the answer is no, um, not really. But yes, if you make the choice to ignore a license, as we just discussed in the iTunes situation. Again, very difficult and complicated issue for you to consider. Um, but again, I think. These are the kinds of things that it's your responsibility to actually think about. OK. The OK, talked about fair use guidelines already. Um, other copyright exceptions. Let us get to the public performances. Because since there's some, these are the questions that probably still are often the ones that we get more than any else is, is public performance. Now, here's something that a librarian told me that a, a copyright trainer told them, which I thought was hysterical. Um, and so we included it in the book. Remember, you can only show a video in the classroom once in your lifetime. Oh my god. Um, so that means you better be a teacher with a really well thought out lesson plan. Of course, this is ridiculous. This is not true. Um, and you can show videos in the classroom in their entirety when they are for curriculum purposes. And this we see in public performances, which is section 110 of the copyright law. There's a face-to-face -face, uh, teaching aspect of it. There's a digital uh, streaming aspect to this um, exception for schools. So showing a video or DVD in the classroom for curriculum purposes, always OK if the copy is lawfully acquired or made. So this means you didn't get the copy of the DVD from BitTorrent. You actually paid for the copy, or you rented the copy, or you know the library acquired the copy. So if it's a lawful copy, you can show it in the classroom. Um, if the video is rented from a video store, if it's from Netflix, you can show it in the classroom, because that's considered lawfully acquired. 
Uh, can you show it, show it more time than, than once? Yes. Can you show it every year? Yes. Um, it's okay if it's a feature film, meaning it's okay if it's a Hollywood production. If it's curriculum related, um, we talk a lot about how we shouldn't show movies just for entertainment purposes or because it's raining outside and people can't do recess. You know, obviously these kinds of uses are not curriculum related. And for those types of uses, a public performance license may be necessary, meaning you have to get permission before you use it in that way. But there are feature length films that you can use that are absolutely curriculum related, depending on what you're teaching. If you're teaching the, um, the you know, a class on the best films of John Ford, you know, obviously you're going to be showing entire feature length films of John Ford in order to teach that class. So sometimes it can be curriculum related. It's not generally okay if you make copies or distribute the public performance outside the classroom. So you don't need to describe to Movie Licensing USA. You do not need to describe, uh, subscribe to Movie Licensing USA unless you want to show films for non-curriculum purposes. And here we're talking about that. Um, if you have a situation in your school where you find that um, you do collect a lot of feature length films, they're used a lot for entertainment, shown at the lunch hour, something like that, then it's probably worthwhile for you to get a Movie Licensing USA license. Um, again, you have to make that determination of whether or not you want to pay an annual fee that I can guarantee will go up every year. Or if you don't use films in that way too often, if you want to instead proceed with getting single licenses as you need to get them. Sometimes you can also, when you buy a title, you can sometimes buy per public performancing rights with that title. It usually is a higher fee. But then in the future, you can go ahead and always show, you know, Gone with the Wind you know, for entertainment purposes and you don't have to worry because you have that additional license. If you're teaching about the Civil War and you show Gone with the Wind in the classroom for curriculum purposes, you do not need a license. So there's, there's this distinction I hope that you can understand. Um, Connie, what about public performance disclaimer on the package? Some limit the size of the audience. Do they need to be purchased from a particular vendor? to have rights to larger groups. All right, I think that this might be sometimes vendors what they're trying what they try to do when they sell um, DVDs to libraries or to schools. They may have like um, an individual license that goes for 29.95 for a consumer. And then they may have an institutional license which they want the library or the school to get based on the notion that this title is going to be over time seen by a lot of people. This is like a price discrimination business plan. Um, it's absolutely legal for people to, to want to charge you more for something like this. Uh, whether or not you have to pay for that is a question that you're going to have to make a decision in your mind about. For me, morally, I when I was a uh, librarian, I would pay the institutional price. Um, I was in a higher education institution. I had a pretty good, um, pretty good money to buy DVDs and stuff. But there's also the argument that the institutional price, if the vendor is saying is necessary in order for you to show it in the classroom, well, that's just not true because you already have the exception under Section 110. So if you are not getting anything, out of the institutional pricing in addition um, to what you already have under the copyright law, I think it is a good, you know, there's an argument to question whether or not you have to pay that higher fee. Um, I would, if you pay a higher fee, I would ask for free replacement copies or discounted replacement copies. I would ask for public performance rights for entertainment purposes. You know, I would try to get everything I can. I would ask for free you know, curriculum materials, because sometimes that institutional price can be really, really super high compared to the individual price. So, you know, it's, 
it's the way the vendor is trying to market their, their work. Uh, we're finding that when we, we inquire about purchasing public performance rights with the DVD, we're told that we can do that. But then when we ask about what they define as public performance rights, they, yeah, they do. And you know, you do, again, Ruth is exactly correct. You do not have to pay for these classroom uses. Sometimes these vendors, they just don't know better. You know, they're, they might not necessarily be trying to rip you off. They just, they're salespeople. They just might not know, you know, what the law says. You know, how would they know? You know, why would they know if they, you know, they're selling titles? They just might not know. Um, so, yeah, classroom use, you don't have to pay extra for that. Um, can it be argued that a teacher will be introducing fairy tales at some point during the year and wants to show a Cinderella now? Um, you know, I, for myself, I would not really get too engaged in um, discussions regarding the curricular, curriculum purposes of the use of titles in the classroom. I would make clear to teachers that the rule is it's got to be curriculum related. Uh, the rule is, um, you know, there's that assumption that you're not just going to show things for grins. S teachers might just go ahead anyhow and show things for grins, um, and you can't prevent that. I think I hear a lot about this from librarians that are, you know, they say, oh, you know, we have a teacher doesn't want to teach today, so they're going to show cartoons all day long. You know, a lot of that stuff is out of your hands. As long as you've told them what the rules are, as you understand them, I think that's as far as, as you can can go. Um, I wouldn't challenge the teacher that wants to show Cinderella now, as long as you've told her already what the rules are. What about, um, OK, a principal wants to reward the kids for good behavior. This happens a lot. Um, again, if you have titles, I think that you know are going to be reward, what we could categorize as reward titles. You know, try to get the public performance rights for that entertainment purpose up front, if, if, if at all possible. Or negotiate that at the time when you're going to use the title for entertainment purposes. Uh, what about videos shown to the entire class? In small classroom settings and in support of the school's mission, discussed in the small group with the, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't really think, you know, the law is not, when you look at section 110, it's not really all that specific about, you know, how you're going to broadcast, how you're going to, in the face-to-face -face situation, if people are going to see it in different classrooms via TV monitor or, you know, via DVD player or in the auditorium or whatever, um, the law does not get that specific, and thank God. What we want to do is just focus on the fact that the title is being showed for an educational reason. Um, this is further emphasized by the fact that small group discussion is going to go on afterwards. Um, and I wouldn't focus too much on, on the other kinds of aspects of that. I hope I'm answering that question. I might not be. Uh, Herb, public performances in K-12. through Parents that film plays and then sell the DVDs. Yes, parents with all good intentions. Um, they want to. Um, you know, their kids in the play, they want to take a videotape, um, you know, they want to sell it or share it with their friends. This happens all the time. Um, in general, rights holders don't discover that this happens. Um, but there are often situations where when you are doing a dramatic play or some kind of situation like that in the school, or a musical or some other kind of narrative dramatic work, there'll be scripts and the scripts that you the students are using come with a license agreement kind of in the script, kind of written in there that, you know, there can be no recording. Um, you might, I mean, it's going to be your decision whether or not you're going to try to really enforce that. I think even if you try to enforce it, parents are going to come with their video recorders anyhow. Um, I would encourage them not to further disseminate the video recordings. I think you certainly are going to get into trouble if you start, you know, selling them, adding them to the library collection, you know, making it very obvious um, that you did, did this thing um, that 
uh, for rights holders in regards to dramatic literary works is a really, really strict kind of area. So um, they'll do it. Um, and with um, music concerts, too, is also true. I think with music concerts, the fact that it's not a dramatic literary work is a little bit, you know, it's less of a concern. Um, uh, but for convenience, okay, so people want to do it because it's convenient. And then later on use it in the classroom. I mean, I think for classroom purposes that might be okay. Um, you know, again, I guess it would it would just it would depend on um, the the kind of work you were talking about, whether or not you got a license agreement when you obtained scripts or or music scores or something like that. Um, whether or not you're going to keep it in the face-to-face -face classroom, you know, whether or not you want to catalog it and put it in your library catalog, all those things are things that you're going to have to think about and make a determination. Yeah, but Julia is right. Sometimes filming is very ex explicit is not allowed. Um, and, and again, uh, particularly with drama. Okay, what else do I have on public performances? That's it. Other questions about public performances? I We could talk about public performances in the digital environment just briefly. There is um, a part of the copyright law that was added in 2002, which is the TEACH Act. Um, it uh, The intention was to allow for the digital use of materials in the distance classroom or in the blended classroom where you might be using digital technologies in the face-to-face -face classroom. The law is, it's not a really good law. I really advise people to look to fair use rather than the TEACH Act because it has a lot of um, parameters involved with it um, that can be very burdensome um, if you look at it really strictly. I think common sense kind of dictates how you're going to be using films in the digital environment. Um, again, you're, you're going to want to make sure that your audience is limited to the enrolled students and you can do that with password protection. You want to make sure that you remind the students that these works are protected by copyright and that they should not further uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, distribute them or copy them. Um, you might want to rely on streaming where, um, you know, the it's kind of more of a live performance and uh, capturing the copy is not as um, likely. Um, again, just some very common sense kinds of uses. Now, under the most recent um, rulemaking uh, conducted by the Copyright Office regarding using clips, clips from various different videos and DVDs and putting them all together and using them in the classroom, in the K-12 through classroom, um, even though that might mean circumventing technology that is used to protect um, DVDs, um, like copyright, um, copy protection technology. The rule now for the next three years is that you can circumvent technology to make a clip to show in the classroom. That's very, very recent. It's quite complicated I, because of all these really, you know, legal terms. I need to write something up about it in plain language and uh, try to do that in the uh, near future. But in the past, you may have thought you couldn't show clips. Um, we always argued that that was a fair use. Now even the Copyright Office is saying, yeah, you can do it. So that's something good to know. Okay, um, we, we have 13 more minutes. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about presentations, but because we're running out of time, and I generally never know how long these presentations are going to last. Um, let me kind of wrap up and we can take questions as well. This is something that I advise for you as the librarian or the educator in the K-12 environment. This is a way I w you can think through the copyright situation. You'll see that, you know, again, nothing is going to be black and white and this is not going to be just completely concrete. Um, and it's good that we have this kind of space in the law where things are not concrete. It's actually a good thing. But this is how you should think through your copyright situation. Look at what you're doing with a work 
you're going to use in the classroom, you're going to put it on, you know, the, the electronic yearbook, whatever you're doing. Ask yourself if that use is infringing. What exclusive rights are being exercised? So think about, oh, what I'm doing here is I'm making a reproduction. What I'm doing here is I'm making a reproduction and I'm distributing this work. So think about the rights that you're actually trying to use. And then think, is there something in the law that already allows me to do this? You know, clearly with uh, aspects of, you know, Section 108, libraries are absolutely allowed to make copies of journal articles and send them through the mail to other people as a as interlibrary loan. You don't even have to worry about that. That's something the law allows. So you may have a situation where there is an exception that already says, fine, go for it. If not, consider fair use. And you're going to have to go through those factors. And you're going to have to weigh them. And you're going to have to make a decision based on just good reasoning, just solid good reasoning. Sometimes you're going to find out, oops, this is really an infringement. Then I look at the situation and I say, like with the teacher, hey, maybe we can tailor back this use. Is it really necessary for you, the teacher, to make, you know, 50 copies of Eleanor Rigby and put, you know, every student have one copy on their, on their player and then also put it on the website and also, you know, put it on YouTube. I mean, there's sometimes people have these ideas of how they want to use a work and maybe they don't really need to use it that way. So maybe you can still meet the teaching goal by using it in a, in a more minor way. And then if you can't, then I, of course, then seek, seek permission. Um, and there is usually permission is um, not that hard to get with a lot of the kinds of things that we're using now. It does require you know, time, which oftentimes we don't have. Um, and I do believe that there are sometimes is situations where it's an emergency use. You know it's kind of not fair, but you want to use it right now. Go ahead and then ask permission after the fact. I think is fine, too. What do I have after this? Let's see. My cold did not get in the way as much as I thought it would. And you guys have been great. Okay, before, you know, years ago I used to talk this way when I first started being interested in copyright and I was, people said I was a communist because they were like, wow, you're just too, you know, too user focused. Well, darn it, that's what we should be. And right, and now as the time has passed, we found that, you know, what we're doing is right. The courts are, have been agreeing with us. People's attitudes have changed. So my recommendations from the communist is that you uh, librarians work with your community. I advise you to tell them what they can do before telling them what they cannot do. People get turned off when you have send out a handout and say you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, people are going to go ahead and do it because you know they're thinking you're being a fascist or something. So. Let them know all the good things about copyright and all the stuff that they can do before telling them what they cannot do. And ask why they want to do things. Again, if you have that, you know, rogue teacher that's just putting things all over the website and, you know, going crazy, try to figure out why they want to use that work in that way when it clearly is infringing and, and probably they don't really need to use it that way. So help make infringing uses is fair uses. And finally, make decisions through your librarian lens. You have a responsibility to your user community to, to ensure that they can have as much access to information as possible within the law. So think about them first and help them be able to be better teachers and better learners. That is the end of my remarks with eight minutes to go. So if people had any additional questions or things that they wanted me to comment on. Herb, to what practical links must a user go to have an older format copied onto a newer format? Um, this is, uh, let me, uh, uh, I'm going to refer you to, um, you can probably, you can find it online. There are, we worked with some media librarians talking about just this kind of thing, like when you want to transfer an older format to a new format, what the law says, and what the community thinks is reasonable. And this, these are called um, fair use practices for video. Um, 
video librarians, something like that. Um, community practices for fair use for video librarians. It's online. That was one of the, just the questions that we asked this group. We had a number of um, focus groups where we met with media librarians and talked to them about what they want to do and whether or not the law is, like, allows them to do that or not. And for the most part, you know, the law is pretty, works pretty well. Um, but you might want to refer to that. Um, it gives you some kind of, like, common sense thinking in regards to that. Um, in, in brief, um, if you're thinking about trying to get um, permission to transfer an older copy to a newer format, um, the links that you have to go to, um, the, the, the only length, first of all, I think you should think about is if you can buy it in the newer format. That should be your first approach. If it's, a, if it's a VHS that's very unique and it's not been transferred or available in the marketplace in the DVD format, your rationale for making a copy is very, very good under fair use. So I don't think you need to go to all kinds of lengths. And the law is actually pretty helpful here because it says that um, when you're looking for that title in the newer format, you should be able to find an unused copy at a reasonable price. So that again helps you. So you can't find a new copy, only old uh, used copies feel more comfortable making the transfer. Um, Janice, hi. Um, She's pointing us to um, a, a blog about copyright issues. Thank you very much, Janice. Janice, I, many of you will know, has written a copyright book. And OK, Jazzy's come in here and said, our producer for today's event, that the room shuts down at 530. So I have to end the presentation at 528. Um, so let me say thank you to everyone. Um, you can certainly always contact me via email. Um, let's see, did I put this on this first thing? Usually I provide my email address. But um, you can find it online. I work for the Washington office, Carrie Russell. I'll be happy to answer questions that you send me. If you want to hear, um, have me answer questions with School Library Journal, write to them because I'm not getting any questions from librarians and so the copyright column that we used to do every other month has kind of been kind of defunct. So if you want some questions answered, you know, please um, get in contact with School Library Journal because that's really kind of a fun venue to answer the kinds of questions that you guys are all having. And I will tell you we will do more free uh, webinars and we will cover different things. Um, it just um, is dependent on our schedule and when we can get these uh, presentation rooms. We have to reserve them. So thanks very much. And I hope it was a good time. It was good for me. Have a great holidays, everyone. Bye-bye.